most seat goes on this. So when you go around a corner, what does it feel like in your car? That you're being pushed outward, right? In fact, if you were on, so let's take a case of the limo. You know, you're in the limo in the back, and maybe there's no seatbelt, or you're not wearing the seatbelt, you're on the big bench seat in the back, and you're in your formal attire, and formal attire tends to be rather slick material, it's very smooth, you're on the, the seat of the limo, which is usually leather, so it's easy to slide around. And if you went around the corner, what would happen? You, you, you feel, oh, I'm being pushed outward against the thing. Well, the question is, are we really? So let's consider, the limo is going this way at a certain velocity. You also have that same velocity going forward. We know this because of Newton's first law, right? Law of inertia. So uh, we're going off in this direction. At some point, the car goes around the corner. Why is the car going around the corner? Well, because the driver pushed, turned the wheel. The wheels of the car put a force on the ground, and the ground puts an equal and opposite force, centripetal force, that causes our car to go around the corner on that. All right, so right here, just as we start the corner on this. All right, so we're going to kind of, we're kind of looking at the seat here. What is happening to the seat? Right spot. There we go. So again, so our seat's going to kind of go around to marking the edge. So I can do kind of like that. All right. So our seat is it's moving around the corner. Now keep in mind the the car itself. You know, as we're going around the corner, the car is going to go around this corner like this. No, it's going around. And there. So the car is going around. We all agree with that, right? There's a force on the car that's causing the car to go around the corner. Okay, like that. But remember, you want to go like that, right? what your body wants to do. If you were in a seatbelt, you would follow along just like the little red dot. I mean, the red dot's you. But, you're not wearing a seatbelt. You keep moving. Now, I have a question. In the car, what would this feel like in the car? It would feel like you were doing what? Sliding across the seat. Okay. In other words, you say, well, I'm moving across the seat. Are you moving? No. no. What's moving? It's not you slide across the seat. It's the seat Sliding moving under you. under you. Because you want to keep going in a straight line. Remember we talked about the deer and all that. When you run into the deer, you want to keep moving. Same idea. You still want to go straight. There's no force on you. The only way you're going to go to court is there's a force on you. Well, there's not very much friction between you and the seat. You're going to keep moving straight until you get to the edge here. In which case, the other door is going to put a force on you inward. Okay, that's even what you feel. You feel like, oh, I'm pushing out against the door. No, you're not pushing against the door. The door is pushing in on you. you. Your seatbelt is pushing in on you. Again, it's a perception thing. We can't think that the car moving and we aren't. We want to go straight. I mean, like all other objects, we want to go straight by Newton's first law. And once you get here, then you're finally going to go around the corner on that. This is why a lot of things, you know, how they go around the corners and things like that. You know, if you ever look at a ship, when it goes around a corner, when it, when it turns, a ship will heel outward. In other words, I'm going around, if I'm going right, the superstructure wants to go out. Why? Because the superstructure, like in the Missouri, it wants to keep going straight. The hull has a force on it because of the rudder it's going around the circle. But the superstructure wants to keep going straight, so it pulls the whole ship over until you get going straight again, then it comes back up to inertia gets in the same line. This is why ships heel outward when they go when they move around a corner on that. Okay, so same idea on that. Which leads us to simulate gravity. It's kind of the same idea. This is how carnival rides work and things like that. You know, if you ever go on the Gravitron, um, 
You know, I know my wife and daughter, so one of their favorite rides. Me, nah. That ride sucks. You ever try to like sit out when it like, spins around? It's crazy. So, where do we live on the earth? We live on the surface. We live on the outside of the spinning earth, right? We live on the outside. Now, so what keeps us from being flung off the earth? Gravity. Gravity is the centripetal force that keeps us going around the earth. All right, so there is a centripetal force that's created by gravity. We have gravity stopped, we go off in a tangential direction at about 700 miles per hour, along with everything else in this room. There's gravity that keeps us attached. But you need lots of mass for that. So, you know, this is not, so the real world is not space opera. Space opera is the, basically the genre of science fiction like Star Trek and Star Wars and things like that. Basically, <laughs> cowboys and Indians in space. Mm -hmm. okay. That's really what Star Trek and Star Wars is. If you get down to it, it's, you know, you have good guys, you have bad guys, and like that. But they just say, okay, we have a device that makes gravity. <coughs> and we don't worry about it. But in the real world, we would need that. Now, actually, if you want to look at a movie that does a really good job of showing how you would really have to get gravity in space. It's actually an old movie, made about 1968, called 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, I have to get I have the DVD at home, but we may, may watch other different parts of it. It's a book. It was written by Arthur C. Clarke, but it was written for the movie, Stanley Kubrick. Um, it's kind of a, well, weird movie, but then again, it's made by Stanley Kubrick, so that's kind of like you know, if you say Stanley Kubrick, weird movie. You should watch like, anything but you know, it's the Same. <laughs> so, but they do show the space station. The space station is rotating because in order to have that, you have to live on the inside. We have to live inside the space station. Kind of works like our Gravitron. The Gravitron ride where you get stuck against the side and all that. Now, the sides of that are angled because there is also gravity. There are two vectors. But in space, would we have gravity? If we were in free fall, would we have to worry about gravity? No, we don't only have to worry about that spinning. Do we have things like that? No. But when we do, we have, we'd have to live on the inside. But what's going on? Anybody need more time? So like these two little bugs, bugs live on the inside. So, but remember, it's go we're going around a circle. They want to go off in that direction. Remember, they always want to go that way. Right? This is what inertia does. It wants to push us that way. But the inside wall pushes you inward. Like that. So if we are on our space station, the floor is going to push you inward. Now your inertia wants to carry you tangential. It wants to give that tangential velocity. And so as you're trying to go this way, the floor is pushing you inward. Constantly pushing you inward. You constantly want to go out, constantly pushing you inward. It feels like gravity. Basically, what you feel is the reaction force on that. Same thing in the Gravitron, right? The Gravitron makes you stick to the side of the wall. Right? You stick to the wall. Because, again, if the, if the little door, if you're against the wall, the little door open up, you go off in a tangent. But you're stuck there because your inertia wants to carry you straight, and the wall is always pushing inward to make you change direction on that. And the faster it moves, the greater that force, right? As the ride gets going faster and faster, what happens to the feeling of you being stuck to the wall? Makes you want to get That's all different issue. But does it feel like you're, you know, when it starts moving faster and faster, it feels like you're getting pushed on it more and more. And more. Because again, your inertia going faster, it wants to push you in, so on. But what velocity, what acceleration would we really want to move our space station at? Well, what centripetal acceleration do we want to give it? What value, what number value? G, right? We want to give it G, that's exactly right. G, 9.81 meters per second squared. Why do we want to give it that? Well, that's normal Earth gravity, because that's what we're going to operate best at. We like one Earth gravity. But if I move toward the center, what's going to happen to the value for, of acceleration? It's going to go 
down, right? Because when you're in the very center, the velocity is zero. Your acceleration would be zero because you have zero velocity at the center. So your acceleration is zero. Um, would being able to adjust gravity be a good thing by moving in? Well, yeah. Some things like medical procedures, there's probably some medical procedures that you want to have at a lower gravity because it puts less stress on the body while you're doing it. Would we want zero G? Probably not because things float away. It's always nice if you drop something and it's going to fall. You know, things like that. So they don't float away. Uh, scalpels, you know, sharp instruments floating around the room, probably not a good idea. Also, if you go far, if we went farther out, what would happen to our gravity? Our simulated gravity, it would go up. And there might be cases, manufacturing processes, some things like that, that you want higher gravity on, on that. So different things going on. Thing is, actually, NASA has done some research, though. Basically, the difference between your, your feet and your, your head and your feet. <laughs> One one hundredth of a gra of a g. In other words, if there is a difference of more than one one hundredth of a g force, in other words, the gravity between your feet and your head were were more than one one hundredth apart, your body doesn't like it. Your body does not like it. In other words, physiologically, you know, your body is always pumping fluids up and down your body. If you have that difference in gravity, it, it just your body doesn't work very well and does so. That so, in other words. Your basically your radius has to be basically a hundred times your height. So if we said that the for a person, you know, the, about the tallest person you might find a space station, say is about two meters, you know, about they are so let's call it seven feet tall. So no one over seven feet tall might be on the space station. That means the minimum radius has to be seven hundred feet, you know, fourteen hundred foot diameter. So basically, that the space station is is big, is the school. That's, that's big, right? That's minimum, minimum size. But space, can we build things that big? Space? Yeah, you know, zero G, we can build as big as we want to. Just have to get all the stuff up there. Um, space station's pretty big in the movie. The one thing they do show, though, is like they have a spacecraft going to Jupiter, and they did have like a rotating ring, like, okay, we're on this very long trip, we have to go to Jupiter, it takes, it takes months and months and months and months and months. And months. And we have this rotating thing. The only thing, it was much too small. It would have been much too small to actually live in. And one of the difficulties of that movie, actually, that was state-of-the-art special effects when the movie was made. You know, when they made that movie, that was state-of-the-art on that. They actually had to move the thing constantly. You know, as they're doing this thing, this thing is rotating, so the people had to move. Like, they're moving around. It makes it look like they're going around circles, but the guys, they're constantly moving the cameras and things like that on that. So this is space station. Do we have any of these? No. Could we build them? Yeah, we could. You know, it's like the issue is technology um, on that. Oh, anybody knows 2001, anybody knows the villain, who the villain was? What? The villain in the movie. What uh, robot, close. R2D2? It was uh, a <laughs> computer. computer. Yeah, the, the computer goes insane. It's a good movie. Like it's a little, little <laughs> plotting at times. It's kind of weird, but it's a good movie. All right, which leads us into center of gravity. Center of gravity. All right. Uh, keep in mind, Thursday, for the, for those of you who did not do the project, Thursday, zero period, last chance to make up the project, the last project the balloon one. Remember, your projects, next project is on Monday. Monday. It's still Monday. <laughs> you bring it in Monday, all ready to be tested. Okay? So, also test Tuesday the 13th will be probably our last regular test of the semester. You. Mm -hmm. Myself finals. Oh. 9, 10, 11. That's going to be so much more boring with that one. <laughs> so, center of gravity. It's the point in an object where the gravitational force seems to concentrate. It's like when you say it's weight, where does the weight come from? I mean, everything in here has a weight vector down. 
but we say there's a certain point that we would draw the weight vector from. Like right there, we say center of gravity, this is where the object's weight vector comes from. Especially when we're dealing with things, issues of rotation, we have to see where is that center of gravity and things like that. This is also the point in a rotating or revolving object that follows the circular projectile path. In any object, even if I, it's the part that's going to follow. If I throw the ball, I mean, this is the center follows that path. But it's something like a ball, very uniform shape on that. Anyone need more time? So, for all these objects, you know, the center of gravity, now again, if you have something nice and uniform, like a ball, uniform thickness, uniform materials can be right in the center. Baseball bat, other places, like my hammer here. The geometric center, like the geometric center of my hammer is somewhere in the handle, right? Somewhere down here. But if I toss it up, you'll notice, does it rotate around the handle or around the head of the hammer? Don't drop it. Around the head of the hammer. It, on that, I mean the balancing point, you can see that that's where the balancing point is, is somewhere about right there. Right about there. So you can see that's where the center of gravity is somewhere in there. And if I threw this, it would follow that path. This is where you should use your so like I, you know, the ball falls path, but our baseball bat knows it's going to follow that, it's going to spin around that. You can see this wrench, the, the white dot is the center of gravity. See how it rotates around that white dot, and that white dot is following this, the projectile path on that. Center of gravity. Center of mass. <laughs> center of gravity can also be empty space. It doesn't actually have to be inside the object. I take my roll of tape. Where is the center of gravity in my roll of tape? It's right in the center. Well, there's not actually anything in the center, but that's where it would be. It's like in our pot, it's in the space, below the chair, things like that. In fact, in our exercise, you have to consider where is my center of gravity going to be when I build my structure today? You know, that's what the connects are for. You guys are going to be building something on that. So, center of mass. Now, center of mass and center of gravity are not the same thing. Center of mass is the average position of the mass in the object. Now, usually, for something, you know, if I took the center of mass of my remote here, it would be the same place as the center of gravity. And basically, everything in the room would be that way. But if something is sufficiently big, sufficiently large that gravity would be different in different parts of it. In other words, the force of gravity it has to do with how far you are from the center. I mean, as I stand here, my feet and my head have a different amount of the force of gravity on them because my head is farther away from the center of Earth than my feet. Now, this distance makes that difference almost infinitesimal. However, if you have something like a skyscraper, Something very large, that difference is going to be much bigger. In fact, it's this gravity distance difference that causes tides on that. Anyone need more tides? Yeah. So, we touched something like the, the solar system. Now, can the center of gravity and center of mass move? Well, yeah. Well, let's think about our solar system. When all the planets all the planets line up on one side, <laughs> line up on one side of the, of the sun, the center of gravity is right here. But that, because all they're all lined up, when the planets move around, what's going to happen to the center of gravity and center of mass? It's going to move around, right? Most of the time, it's probably be somewhere inside of the sun. Yes. But it also, if you were an astronomer, it would, now remember, this is the point that follows the path of our sun around the galaxy. It takes our sun about 30,000 years, the galaxy to go around one time. 
to an astronomer, it would look like this. the sun is like wobbling back and forth. In fact, this is one of those tools that astronomers use to find planets around other stars. Because if you, for the most part, you cannot see a planet in a telescope. When the ones they say they do pictures of are just gargantuan, I mean, they're like much bigger than Jupiter. Planets they actually have seen with telescopes are much bigger than Jupiter. But so planets like the Earth size, you wouldn't be able to see, but astronomers can see the star wobble, and they've learned, hey, our star wobbles because it has planets going around it. So if I see another star wobble back and forth, that's an indication of how that there must be planets going around that star. That's what causes that wobble. And then they use other tools like universal gravitation to figure out how many planets and where they're moving and things like that. I, I don't, you know, it's much, it gets much, much more complicated but this is the idea that this moving planet, in other words, why do we study our own solar system? Well, we study our own solar system so we can learn, we can see, hey, this is what happens in our solar system. When I look at this other thing, when I, even though I can't see the planets, because the star wobbles, there must be, there has to be some mass going around that's changing on that. Now the Earth and the Moon, you have the Earth-Moon system, the center of gravity for the Earth-Moon system is actually right about there. It's about a thousand miles, a thousand miles outside of the center of the Earth. On that, but that is actually the point that follows the Earth's orbit. It's not the, the Earth's orbit does not follow through the center of the Earth. Our orbit around the Sun. It's this point because this point they both basically they revolve around. It is that point or around that. Okay. But it's this whole idea of center of mass. Now the skyscraper, you know, you look at a skyscraper, basically most of it's above ground, you have some below ground. That's how skyscrapers built. The center of mass for a skyscraper is above usually above street level. It's just how they build them. Center of mass is somewhere above street level. But because this is so tall, the force of gravity at this end and the force of gravity at that end are different. In other words, it's greater at the bottom because the bottom is closer to the center of the Earth than at the top. So it causes... Hey, Mr. Ruth, you ever look up in the sky and you see like something the size of a star? Would be too slow to be like a shooting star, but like too fast to be anything we've made? Could crazy. be a satellite. But it's the one like, it's different. It's could be. It's, you can see satellites. <laughs> if you're at Sprague Third Night, you can actually see satellites moving, transit satellites, you know, there's closer orbit satellites, you can see them. It's like way there, it's going like this. Yeah, it's a satellite. See what you're tripping. <laughs> So the center of gravity, CG, is going to be slightly below the center of mass. Slightly below. Um, now we're not talking a lot. We're talking about probably only a few centimeters. Okay, but they are not in the same place on that. So all it has to do, the location has to do with something called toppling. And if you open your books, those of you who have a book, which you're all supposed to have your book in class every day. <laughs> but if you have a book and you open up to chapter 10, you have that chapter 10, there's a picture in there in chapter 10 of a bus. You might recall that there was a picture of the bus. It's on page 140. And they tell you in that that the standard is that the bus, the bus has to be, these are these London double-decker buses, that when they're fully loaded on top, in other words, the entire top is filled with people, there's no one at the bottom, that they should be able to go over 28 degrees and not roll over. And so they test them. This is basically this plane that tips, tilts them over. And this truck still hasn't fallen over. It knows they're at 40 degrees. So it could go 40 degrees. It would still come back to its wheels. It'd be like going around a corner, go up on one wheel on that. So, but this idea is called toppling. Now, toppling is just the physics word for falling over, fall down. And as long as the center of gravity is over the base, 
they're going to stand up. As soon as you go beyond the base, you're going to roll down. It has to do with rotation. Which way is it going to rotate? So there's my, thing. you can think of it like a fulcrum. Now I'm pushing down with this force here. Is it going to cause me to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise? Yeah. That's how we talk about motion, clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. With this force here, which way is it going to cause me to move? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay. It's going to cause me to go clockwise. So it's going to roll it back on its base, which is why the leaning tower pizza does not fall over. Its center of gravity is still over its base. If the center of gravity ever got on this side of the base, it would cause it to start toppling over. This is how things fall over. Again, our bus here, the pivot is the wheel, so its center of gravity is somewhere still pulling it that direction so it doesn't roll over. So the idea here is that on all these, the pivot is here in this corner. This force pulling down is going to cause, wants to cause a rotation to the right, clockwise rotation. It's not going to roll over. This one, now go, that goes straight to the base. Is that going to cause clockwise or counterclockwise rotation at all? No. no, it's going right through the pivot, right through the axis, not doing anything. This one, notice our like force is now to the right, it's going to cause counterclockwise rotation, so it is going to tumble over, it's going to roll over on that. So stability has to do with the tendency of something to topple or return to its original position. <coughs> Depends on which direction the center of gravity moves. Which way does the center of gravity move? So, stable equilibrium. With stable equilibrium, the center of gravity moves up. And this is going to cause the, the object to return to its position. If you look up here, see this white dot? That's basically the center of gravity of our traffic cone. And when I lift it, when I pull it over, notice from the original position, where does, uh, where does it go? It goes up. And so it goes back onto its base on that. Anyone need more time? We just started. Mm -hmm. Give you like five seconds. <laughs> now, <laughs> unstable equilibrium, the center of gravity is lowered. The lower the object topple. Now, if we look at here, now I can turn my cone upside down. It's very easy to see it's going to go down. But notice my cone. Now, watch the center of gravity here. Right? Here's the little center of gravity. Now, at first it goes up, but it gets to a point where it starts going what? down again, and when it gets below the original point, it, go, it will topple over. Alright, so it keeps going over. I mean, if I put it up upside down, it's very easy to see. You know, here's my center of gravity. Any way I go, it's going to go down, and it's going to topple over. What? You still let go? I don't know, I was in the room when I... Okay, not sure, not still. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> now, neutral equilibrium. Center of gravity doesn't go up or down. That would be like the, the, this thing rolling across the table. If center of gravity doesn't go up or down, so it doesn't topple, it doesn't fall over, just stays the way it is on that. And that would be neutral equilibrium. Okay. Let's talk about the Space Needle. Space Needle. Anybody really know where the Space Needle is? Yeah. Washington. Seattle. Yeah, this is a very iconic structure. 
It was built for the 1962 World's Fair that was held in Seattle. It was their central, you know, whenever they, back in the day when they had World's Fairs, they would have a center structure that was kind of theme for their representative. This, and so this was the Space Needle. It was built for that. It was kind of their last minute thing, but they got it up on that. So I forget, the observation deck is like, I think some like 560 feet above, um, above the ground. So the observation deck up here on that. And um, there's a revolving restaurant on the bottom, the observation deck on the top. And um, there's a this, this ben, part is ben, a restaurant. It's like the, um, well, yeah, the Eiffel Tower, I think, is taller. But in the Space Needle now, you got to remember, <laughs> Seattle. Seattle is a lot like San Francisco. I mean, actually, if you go to Seattle, it's very much like San Francisco. Um, hills. You know, the lot of hills. <laughs> they have earthquakes. Big earthquakes. But they have one additional thing that we don't have. It's the fact that Seattle is built at the base of a volcano. It is. Mount Rainier is a volcano. Just like Mount St. Helens and Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta, they're all volcanoes. And so they get earthquakes because of the volcanoes and things like that. So this structure had to be built to withstand quite a lot. You know, on that. So we want to predict. Now you're going to write this down, this prediction down, and explain why you think it's there. We want to know where is the center of gravity? So where do you think the center of gravity? So is the center of gravity A up here at the top where the observation deck is? Right there. B, right where this first big constriction is. B. Maybe here, part way down. D. B. Well, be, actually, that's a C. <laughs> exactly not D. Like maybe D would it be about where most skyscrapers, where the center of gravity of most skyscrapers are. B. Is it going to be E at ground level or F below ground? So write down where you think it's going to be and why you think that that is where the center of gravity is. It's B, because I'm going gray. <laughs> so inappropriate. So, how many of you think A is the center of gravity? The top. B, where they constrict. B. C, where... Here. B. <laughs> E, ground level, F, below ground. All right, and so the answer is letter F. You are the first time you're like that. No, I'm wrong the sign. Now, let's think about this. If this starts to move, like there's an earthquake or something like that, if it started to move, which way is center of gravity going to go? So it's going to go up. No matter what, the center of gravity is going to go up. So it's going to tend to carry the structure back to its normal position on that. Now, could it still fall over? Yeah, well, if one of the legs snapped off, obviously it could break off. But it's not going to topple over because of its base. You have to break it. And there's a reason for that. Three-story foundation. Foundation space needle. It's like this is, this is actually a placard inside the observation deck. On April 17th, and this was, I think, 1961, under the direction of the contractor, construction began on the Space Needle Foundation. Workers labeled continuously for 11 days to dig a 30-foot deep, 120-foot wide hole. Workers then laid 250 tons of reinforcing bar, the so rebar, down into the, into the base. And on May 26, 1961, they broke the record for the largest continuous concrete pouring to that date, 467 trucks working 12 hours, solid hours, put 5,850 tons of concrete into that hole. I don't see the point. Yeah. All of these, basically this massive base is what causes the space needle. In other words, this base has much more mass than the structure above it. I mean, the Space Needle structure isn't that great because of the way it's built. That's an opinion. The <laughs> yeah, I'm All right. So, think about this. Yes, sir. It's kind of like those things that have like, little toys and everything. Yeah, kind of. 
So they never tell for like the punching bags, you hit them and yeah. they come back, things like that. Now, you guys are going to be, use your connects over there, and we're going to try to build, build something. And what you're going to build is something, you want to build the tallest structure you can vertically that will balance on the point here. Now the thing is, the only place where the connects can touch is right here at the top. It's the only point it can touch, right at the top. In other words, you have to balance it in some way. You have to think, how am I going to get this thing upward and keep my, keep my center of gravity so that if this starts tilting over, it's going to bring it back to the center. So you're using your kit. Now all the kits are identical on that. But remember, you can't build something that kind of sticks like this over the top. Because that would be touching at more than one point. In other words, the only place it can touch here, and it has to balance in some way on the top. So think, where does my center of gravity be? Do my center of gravity going to be on top? Is my center of gravity going to be on the bottom? And think of that way. But we want to know that it's tall as possible. Now, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a little game. It's kind of like a little competition between the groups. You want to work with your own group on that, right? So you want to make it as tall as possible. I will come around and start measuring at about 20 after. So you have about a half hour to work on this to get as tall as possible. But shh, for those of you who've never used Connects before. They're super easy. Shh. Who've never used Connects before. Now, the little rods sit, the little rods just slide in. They just slide in on that. But the, even these pieces, if you put them together, they will go together like that. The different pieces will go together. So you can connect them together uh, on that. Think about weight of objects, where you want your weight, and things like that. Okay? So grab your kit, get together with your group, and start building. By the way, once you get one to work, you want to draw a diagram in your notes. This is an exercise. Once you have a diagram in your notes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>